I thought it would be interesting if we could discuss over a series of conversations, Nietzsche's history of the future. Such a discussion would give us a more profound understanding of modern art and modern thought, as well as postmodern thought and postmodern art, although I think that art should be placed in quotation marks there because most postmodern art so-called is not art at all, but so-called postmodernism right, is really nothing more than the academicizing of anti-foundationalist thinking, and in particular, the thought of Nietzsche, who is a genuinely anti-foundationalist thinker, right? So Nietzsche's history of the future laid out somewhat schematically is this. First comes the death of God, thence nihilism, right? Thence the last human being, Thence, the great noon, and concomitant with that, the emergence of the doctrine of the eternal recurrence of the same. Thence, overhumanity, as I translate it from the German, you know, the overhuman. Now, I will expostulate each moment of this sequence over the course of multiple videos. But for now, let me pause over the death of God. Nietzsche never actually denies the existence of God. If you read Human All Too Human, a book for free spirits, you will know that Nietzsche affirms that the existence of a God could scarcely be denied. But if one does exist, if a God does exist, God is otherwise. God is absolutely otherwise, right? Think about it for a minute. This is what is called in theology, apophasis. Apophasis is negative theology, right? What is God? You can't say what God is because God is not an entity. God is not a tree. God is not a house. God is not a dog. God is not even a human being. All you can do in order to establish what God is, is to look at what God is not. Again, apophasis, negative theology. God is otherwise. So here, Nietzsche passes quite close to Epicurus, who really is his precursor in the gay science, to be sure. Nietzsche quotes uh, Epicurus repeatedly in the gay science, which is an Epicurean book. It's not a Schopenhauerian book. It's an Epicurean book. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. For Epicurus, the gods exist, to be sure but the gods do not care about us, right? Epicurus was a deist. He believed that gods existed. The gods do not concern themselves over us. If you read Lurianic Kabbalism, right, the Kabbalah, you will know that God is nominated as Ein Sof, which means no end. God is limitless, preformative, formless, God is, although God does not exist, you know, language becomes strained at this point. What verb do we use? Let's just say God is in quotation marks or perhaps crossed out, you know. God is in quotation marks before any concrete instantiation. God is in quotation marks before any concrete manifestation. God is the unresemblant. God is the illimitable, right? Now, an early striation of Christianity is the Gnostic religion, Gnosticism. And in Gnosticism, God is the untraceable. God is the untraceable. That is to say, God cannot be represented. God is a non-being. God is the abyss. God is the incomprehensible. And if you'd like to read about that, read a book by Hans Jonas, surname spelled J-O-N-A-S, entitled The Gnostic Religion. Highly recommended. And if you'd like to read about the Kabbalah, read this amazing book by Gershom Sholm, entitled On the Kabbalah and Its Symbolism. All right, then. What is the death of God? By this phrase, Nietzsche does not mean that God is literally dead. 
Now, Christopher Hitchens, the late Christopher Hitchens, or as I call him, the Critchens, uh, wrote in a book that was published posthumously entitled Mortality. And I'm just paraphrasing. How could God die if he never existed? How could God die if he never lived? Michel Foucault, in this book, writes the same thing in, in um, an essay on Georges Bataille entitled A Preface to Transgression. Highly recommended. Um, I'm not an admirer of Foucault, but he has written some strong texts, to be sure, and this is one of them. Um, I'll create a video about that later on. But Foucault poses the same question. How could God die if he never lived? Well, this is not Nietzsche's point of departure. Now, if you look, if you look at the Gospels, you know, the synoptic Gospels, read the Gospel according to Mark, if you've not yet done so. Read, I believe it's chapter 10 of the Gospel according to Mark, and you'll, you'll remember the story of a woman, a peasant woman who comes up to Jesus and says, Master, you are good. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, why good? Only God is good. Now, anyone who says that, anyone who says only God is good is clearly not identifying oneself as God. Here's another passage. I, I might be wrong, but I believe it's the gospel according to uh, Matthew chapter 27, in which Jesus famously says, uh, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Now, translated from the Aramaic, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As Jesus is bleeding out, exsanguinating on the crucifix, on the cross. Well, anyone who cries out to the heavens, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Again, translated from the Aramaic, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? is not identifying oneself as God. So consider this. If we do identify Jesus as God, which is done, which is done in other parts of the Christian Bible, right? Then death is purely theatrical. In fact, it's comedic because death passes over into revivification, revivification, right? Resurrection. Jesus is revivified. He dies and then is resurrected. So consider that for a moment. Um, I want to say something in order to clear up misunderstandings about Nietzsche's concept of the death of God. When Nietzsche writes God is dead, he doesn't mean one single God. He is not alluding merely to the Christian God, he means belief in all deities, in all demiurges, in all divinities. So what does Nietzsche mean by God is dead? He means we do not appeal to divine supervision anymore. We do not appeal to divine supervision anymore and divine authority in our experiences. We no longer appeal to divine supervision and divine authority in our experiences anymore. So misfortune is not immediately traceable back to punishment or to telishment. Telishment, if you've read Rawls, you know this, punishment um, Telishment is punishment of the innocent for the sake of the crowd. No. So happiness is not immediately traceable to God's favor, right? Something good happens to us. It's not because God is shining on us. If something miserable is happening to us, it is not because the devil is attacking us in some way. Disease is no longer seen as the poisonous fruit of the devil. It was once believed this, though. It was once believed that all illness was of diabolical origin. Most of us do not believe in the demonic causation of disease. 
our experiences are generally no longer perceived as repetitions of the transcendent, or at the very least, we do not live in a culture in which the things of the world are perceived as the reproduction of transcendent prototypes. I'm going to read for your benefit a passage that the most reverend Jordan Peterson does not quote. This is from paragraph 343 of the Gay Science. And I question whether or not Jordan Peterson, the, I'm sorry, the most reverend Jordan Peterson has in fact read this passage. Paragraph 343 of the Gay Science. The greatest recent event that God is dead that the belief in the Christian God has become unbelievable is already starting to cast its first shadow over Europe. Right there, there's the definition of the death of God. And here's the text in the German. If you're interested, I'll just read it in German. Was es mit unserer Heit? Let me start again. Was es mit unserer Heiterkeit auf Sieg hat, das größte neuere Ereignis, das Gott tot ist, dass der Glaube an den christlichen Gott unglaubwürdig geworden ist, beginnt bereits seine ersten Schatten über Europa zu werfen. So there you have it. There is the definition of the death of God, which Jordan Peterson never quotes. Now, what does this mean? It means that we no longer stellify our experiences. We no longer angelize our experiences. We today no longer, to quote um, Nietzsche's notebooks, written between April 1885 and June 1885, we no longer see everywhere the traces of God's solicitude. Warning, punishment, instruction, End of quotation. He defines the death of God for us in the 1885 notebooks as well, which means that we can now begin to sanctify and sacralize the earth, which he writes about in Also Sprach Zatustra, which Jordan Peterson, I'm sorry, the most reverend Jordan Peterson ignores, or perhaps doesn't even know very well. We can sacralize the earth. But sacred here does not mean something which is forbidden to desire, right? Sacred here does not mean something which it is forbidden to desire, something that is untouchable and something that must remain untouchable. No, it means rather that the terrestrial is the celestial. Earthliness is transcendence. So the death of God means that we no longer interpret the good things that happen to us as divine rewards or the bad things that happen to us as divine punishments. We no longer see illness as the curse of a demon or a birth as the blessing of an angel. We understand epidemiology. We understand embryology. We understand science. Science has taken the place of religion as the interpreter of human events, as the most authoritative interpreter of human events. So God is dead because God is death. Let me say that again. God is dead because God is death. If you believe in an unsensory, suprasensory, inapprehensible beyond anymore, we don't believe in the epikina anymore. So now we know what the concept of the death of God signifies. The question is, is this a mournful historical event, an event that is worthy of bereavement, according to Nietzsche? Now, let me pause over this. Let me pause over this question for a moment. Now, according to the most reverend Jordan Peterson, the death of God is the most sorrowful event in modernity. And that is fine, fine. My problem with Peterson is that he misascribes 
his own sorrow over the death of God to Nietzsche. He also, parenthetically, does not know what the word agreeable means. You might know this if you've listened to the most reverend Dr. Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson is the type of person who will say again and again, you know, if you're agreeable, you're overly submissive at work. He, Peterson thinks that agreeable means acquiescent, submissive, complacent with an AI, obeisant with an EI. He doesn't understand what the word means. Agreeable means pleasant. It means enjoyable. It doesn't mean submissive or acquiescent. I mean, the man thinks that um, agreeable means docile, it seems. Anyway, so the most reverend Jordan Peterson is, I would say, a Christian existentialist. Christian existentialist is a contradictio ad adjecto, if there ever was one, a contradiction in terms, contradictio ad adjecto. Because how could one be a Christian existentialist? I've always wondered this, because an existentialist is someone who regards the human being as a ceaseless generator of meanings, right? Human beings endlessly produce meaning. There is no meaning pre-inscribed in the world, but a Christian has faith that meaning is divinely, theophanically pre-inscribed in the book of the world. So these are two, I would say, um, incommensurable, incompatible positions. They're not coextensive at all. How could, you, how could one be a Christian and an existentialist? I never understood that, but the most reverend Jordan Peterson is such a person. He is a Christian existentialist who has dangerously falsified the teachings of Nietzsche, which is why I'm making this video, one of the reasons. By Christianizing them. It's as if Peterson believes that Nietzsche is some kind of crypto-Christian, or as the most reverend Jordan Peterson says, Nietzsche was a strange friend to the faith, by which Peterson means the Christian faith. Nietzsche, of course, was no Christian. You only have to read one page of any of his published writings to know that, but Peterson apparently has missed the memorandum. Um, no, Nietzsche was not a strange friend to the faith, nor was Nietzsche an existentialist, even though Peterson calls him an existential philosopher or a proto-existentialist. He is, no, Nietzsche was not even a proto-existentialist, as the most reverend Dr. Jordan Peterson fallaciously claims. He also styles himself as the official interpreter of the word, the gospel of Nietzsche. And this is why I must animadvert upon his false interpretation of Nietzsche. Whenever one executes an internet search, on Nietzsche, one finds Nietzsche's name inextricably married to the name of Jordan Peterson, which means, of course, that Peterson's misinterpretation of Nietzsche has occluded the original text, which is a real sin against philology. So let me quote the most reverend Dr. Jordan Peterson on the death of God. It's amazing. On the 18th of April, 2019, uh, the most reverend Dr. Jordan Peterson had this to say about the Nietzschean death of God. When Nietzsche announced the death of God, which by the way, as you may know from listening to my lectures, So that's the only way that one could get access to Nietzsche is through Peterson's lectures. Well, when Nietzsche announced the death of God, which by the way, as you may know from listening to my lectures, this was not precisely a triumphal, it wasn't an announcement of triumph. It was a warning 
and the tolling of the bells of sorrow. That's a good way of thinking about it. Even though Nietzsche styled himself as a vicious, as an intellectually vicious critic of institutionalized Christianity, which he certainly was, he was also a strange friend to the faith. I think in, a, in the most fundamental sense, that's the truth. So when Nietzsche announced the death of God, he did it sorrowfully. Well, no. Well, I'll get into that in a moment, but these are not adventitious remarks. These remarks are at the core of the most reverend Dr. Peterson's thinking. Whenever he lectures or interviews, Dr. Peterson refers to Nietzsche almost without exception. And whenever he speaks of Nietzsche, he invariably, he invariably speaks of the death of God. On the June 8th episode, June 8th, 2018 episode of a video series entitled, fittingly, The Big Conversation, The Big Conversation, Dr. Peterson had this to say. You, you know, Nietzsche announced, of course, in the 1880s, in the late 1880s, that God was dead. I'm sorry, no, no, no. Nietzsche announced that God was dead in 1882. 1882 is not the late 1880s. It's the early 1880s. Typical rationalist atheists regard that as a triumphal a triumphalist proclamation. But that wasn't the case for Nietzsche. But that wasn't that for Nietzsche. Nietzsche knew perfectly well and said immediately afterward that the consequences of that was going to be a bloody catastrophe because everything was going to fall. Nietzsche knew perfectly well that when you remove the cornerstone from underneath the building, that even though it may stay aloft in midair, like a cartoon character that's wandered off a cliff, wandered off the cliff, that it will inevitably come to crumble. Now, I do agree that the death of God is a disruption in the way in which the world is diegetically organized, right? It's what's called a, a pattern interruption, absolutely. But by no means does Nietzsche respond disconsolately to the death of God. Dr. Peterson makes the claim that Nietzsche was really very sad about the death of God almost everywhere he goes. On the 16th of May, 2018, Dr. Peterson participated in a structured question and answer session at the Oxford Union. When an exceedingly bright student asked him, when an, when an exceedingly bright student asked him if meaning is artificially imposed on the world by human beings, good question, good question, Dr. Peterson uttered this non-response in response. When Nietzsche announced the death of God, which is something that he announced in sorrow and trembling, I would say, rather than triumphantly, which is often how that's read because people don't actually read Nietzsche. They just read one half of a quote from Nietzsche. Right, only you read Nietzsche. We'll get to that in a minute. But no, Nietzsche did not announce the death of God in fear and trembling. That phrase, of course, comes from Kierkegaard. It's as if Peterson is confusing Nietzsche for Kierkegaard. And I have to ask, but have you truly read Nietzsche, Dr. Peterson? If anything, the most reverend Dr. Jordan Peterson is the illiteratus and his followers, the illiterati. Nietzsche was sad about the death of God is a false axiom to refute. Dr. Peterson's erroneous claim that Nietzsche mourned the death of God, one only has to consult the following passage from Also Sprach Zarathustra, thus spoke Zarathustra, translated as On the Apostates. 
It has been over for the gods a long time now. And indeed, they had a fine, joyful God's end. They did not twilight themselves to death. That is a real lie. Rather, they laughed themselves to death. This is from Alzusprach Zatustra, and I'd like to read it in the German as well, so that we could find out what we what I've been suggesting, namely that Nietzsche anticipated the misinterpretation of his proclamation that the death of God would come. And in fact, the death of God had already come. But much like much like a star, it takes a very long time for the light to reach us. Anyway. Mit den alten Göttern ging es ja lange schon zu Ende und wahrlich ein gutes, fröhliches Götterende hatten sie. Sie dämmerten sich nicht, nicht zu Tote. Das lügt man wohl. Vielmehr, sie haben sich selber einmal zu Tote <laughs> so, Dr. Peterson believes that Nietzsche is one of those who think they want the destruction of God, but who creep around God's tomb at midnight, or creep at midnight around God's tomb. Mitternachts um das Grab seines Gottes schleicht. And that is from another section of Ozosprach Dautustra called von den Hinterwelten, which might be translated as on the afterworldly, <laughs> because there's an interesting kind of obscene pun there, on the afterworldly, not a bad way of translating it. And Jordan Peterson is the mournful mourner, not Nietzsche, who never mourns the death of the old gods. Casey, the most reverend Jordan Peterson. Despite what the most reverend Jordan Peterson says, Nietzsche exalts in the death of God. He rejoices over the death of God, by which he really means the death of all gods, not merely the death of the Christian God. The death of God, ex the death of God ecstasizes Nietzsche. Yeah, the death of God ecstasizes Nietzsche. It throws him into an ecstasy. The death of God necessitates dissymmetry between one human being and another. There is an equalization of humanity when most believe in a, in a supreme deity. Why is that? A supernatural demiurge. Why is that? All of us are equal because we are all immeasurably below one God. Once God dies, there is no longer a reason to ignore the differences, the discrepancies between human beings. And again, when Nietzsche declares the death of God, he doesn't mean that any God has literally died. Not at all. He means that we don't believe in God anymore, as a rule, or that God does not govern human affairs anymore, which is, is uh, a trait of modernity. You know, this is not very well known, but did you know that Nietzsche projected a sequel to Thus Spoke Zarathustra? It's true. Uh, he projected a sequel to Also Sprach Zarathustra, and he was going to call this book the sequel, volume two of Also Sprach Zarathustra, The Eternal Recurrence. And I just want to quote, and this is in the 1886, 1885, 1886 notebooks, which you may read if you'd like. In this volume, published by Stanford University Press, here is a description of something that would happen in part one of the text. In the end, Zarathustra gives the explanation, God is dead. This is the cause of the greatest danger? Quotation mark, I'm sorry, question mark, right? This is the cause of the greatest danger? Question mark. What? It could also be the cause of the greatest courage. 
exclamation mark. I don't think Jordan Peterson has ever read this. And if he did read it, it would cause him a great deal of distress because it would shatter his misinterpretation of Nietzsche. Here's, um, this would be in part three of the eternal recurrence. Again, this would be Nietzsche's second novel, his first being Also Sprach Zarathustra. The death of God for the prophet, the most terrible event, is the happiest and most hopeful event for Zarathustra. Now, I think most would agree that Zarathustra is the alter ego of Nietzsche. And the prophet, well, that's pretty much the most reverend Jordan Peterson, right? And I just want to read these two passages in German. And it's from this text here, the notebooks of 1885 and 1886. There you go. You need to see that. Okay. So this is it in German. Zuletzt gibt Zarathustra die Erklärung, Gott ist tot. Dies ist die Ursache der größten Gefahr. Wie? Sie könnte auch die Ursache des größten Muts sein. And here is the passage from part three of this project, this draft. Well, it's an outline, really. It's an outline for the eternal recurrence. Der Tod Gottes für den Wahrsager, das furchtbarste Ereignis, ist das glücklichste und hoffnungs, hoffnungsreichste und hoffnungsreichste mit Zarathustra. So, I don't really know. I mean, I, well, I know very well why Jordan Peterson is making these claims because he is sorrow, sorrowful and he's a Christian existentialist, which is to say he's a sorrowful, mournful, disconsolate uh, Christian existentialist. Now, he has the unaccountable idea and Peterson misses the context, right? Now, in paragraph 125 of The Gay Science, which Peterson, to his credit, does, quote, in an English translation, he doesn't know German, I don't think, um, it is the lunatic who runs into the marketplace, right? The lunatic runs into the marketplace screaming that God is dead. But here's a question. Why should he, namely Jordan Peterson, believe the words of a lunatic? Why should he believe the words of a lunatic? Simply because the lunatic is sorrowful over the death of God, this does not imply that Nietzsche is sorrowful over the death of God. Secondly, why does the madman light a lantern and run into the marketplace with an illumined lantern in the morning? No one ever writes about this or talks about this. So, so <laughs> notice this. The lunatic runs into the marketplace with an illumined lantern in the morning. Why is that? Does that not cast doubt on the lunatic's proclamations? The lunatic in the marketplace bethinks himself mournfully of the death of God. But this does not mean that Nietzsche bethinks himself mournfully of the death of God. And there's a third thing to say. Uh, thirdly, the point is that the death of God potentiates human beasts to become human gods, according to Nietzsche. And Peterson misses this point. Because we now recognize that there are no gods, finally we can become gods ourselves. And again, I hasten to add, this doesn't mean that gods don't exist. This doesn't mean that God does not exist. It just means that gods or God does not intervene in human affairs. And because we are conscious of this fact now with the so-called death of God, which probably isn't a good way of putting it, uh, Martin Buber, who I do have here, um, calls this the eclipse of God, which is probably a better way of putting it. Uh, this is a, an amazing book by Martin Buber, Martin Buber, The Eclipse of God. I, I've always thought that this was a better way of, of putting it. 
instead of the death of instead of the death of God, the eclipse of God. And I wouldn't even have a problem if Peterson referred to this book. I wouldn't have a problem with him. I really wouldn't. Um, but the point that Nietzsche is making is that because we now recognize that gods are eclipsed, we can finally become gods ourselves. So the death of God, or as Hubert points out, the eclipse of God potentiates the self-elevation of humanity. We can thence raise ourselves to our greatest height. We can thence raise ourselves to our greatest height. If you want an example of how deleterious faith can be, look no further than the story of Abraham and Isaac, right? Here you have the story of a father who was willing to slaughter his eldest son because the father hears voices. The father hears a voice in his head that adjures him to do so, right? To slaughter his eldest son. This is very similar, of course, to the Greek myth of Iphigenia, but that's another subject for another day. But the death of God means that we will no longer hear such voices reverberating in our heads. But like the light from a distant star, it will take years for the news to reach us. Nietzsche does acknowledge the possibility that God exists, but he means that we will no longer hear divine adjurations in our heads. So what I'd like to do at this point is I'd like to read one more passage for you, and then we will conclude. So I will conclude with a quotation from Proust. And this is a passage that, in which the narrator called sometimes Marcel, much like the author Marcel Proust, is meditating over the death of the artist Bergot. And they say he here is Bergot. He was dead. Dead forever? Who can say? Certainly experiments in spiritualism offer us no more proof than the dogmas of religion that the soul survives death. All that we can say is that everything is arranged in this life as though we entered it, carrying a burden of obligations contracted in a former life. There is no reason inherent in the conditions of life on this earth that can make us consider ourselves obliged to do good, to be kind and thoughtful, even to be polite, nor for an atheist artist to consider himself obliged to begin over again a score of times a piece of work, the admiration aroused by which will matter little to his worm-eaten body. Like the patch of yellow wall, painted with so much skill and refinement by an artist, destined to be forever unknown and barely identified under the name Vermeer. All these obligations, which have no sanction in our present life, seem to belong to a different world, a world based on kindness, scrupulousness, self-sacrifice, a world entirely different from this one and which we leave in order to be born on this earth before perhaps returning there to live once again beneath the sway of those unknown laws which we obeyed because we bore their precepts in our hearts, not knowing whose hand had traced them there. Those laws to which every profound work of the intellect brings us nearer and which are invisible only, if then, to fools. So that the idea that Bergot was not permanently dead is by no means improbable. Again, that's a quotation from Proust, in particular from the captive, la prisonnière in French. Um, thank you very much. I didn't give you my name yet, if you don't know. My name is Joseph Sulia, S-U-G-L-I-A. Thank you very much. And please join me for the next video, which will concern nihilism. I will record that tomorrow, probably the day thereafter. Thank you very much. This is Joseph Sulia.
signing out and signing off. Goodbye.